In this video, I'm going to talk about another important method of program flow control in Python, and that is the if statement. As usual, what you're looking at is the spider IDE, which I have running on a Windows instance at Amazon Web Services. Here in the editor window on the left, I've opened the code file associated with this video, which is Spider with Python 14, which you can download from the link provided with this video. Here at the beginning of the code file, I have documented the syntax of the if statement, and I've put this documentation between the triple quote comment delimiters that allows you to put documentation at the beginning of a Python file. So in Python 2.7, the basic syntax of the if statement is as follows. It begins with the word if, and then there is a logical expression, which will evaluate to either true or false. This is followed by a colon, which indicates that a code block is about to occur. If the logical expression evaluates to true, then the code block immediately below that is indicated by the colon and by indentation will execute. And once the code block has finished execution, the entire if statement will be exited, which means that anything in the elif or else statements that we're about to discuss will be skipped entirely. Now, if the logical expression next to the if statement is false, then the code block immediately following will be skipped and the elif line will be executed. This elif stands for else if, and it is entirely optional. It doesn't have to be there. But if the first logical expression is false and the elif statement is there, then its logical expression is evaluated. And if its logical expression is true, then the code block immediately following, which is signaled by the colon at the end of the elif line, and also again the indentation, this code block will be executed, and when it's complete, then the program will jump all the way out of the if statement and continue on. But if this second logical expression next to the elif is false, then the code block associated with that elif will be skipped, and then the next line will be evaluated, which is the else. And the code block associated with the else statement is executed if all of the logical expressions prior to it that are associated with the if statement and the elif statements, if all of those are false, then the code block associated with the else statement is executed. The else statement is optional, and the elif statements, as I said before, are also optional, but there can also be more than just one elif statement. So there can be a whole bunch of those. So that's the basic syntax of the if statement in Python. Now I've swept some details under the rug. For example, these logical expressions actually can uh, be things other than logical expressions. But if you are following good coding practices, you will try to make your code as readable as possible. And that means what really belongs where I have the words logical expression is in fact a logical expression that will evaluate to either true or false. Now most of the people listening to this video will have had some kind of experience with if statements before. In many cases, people will have had experience with the if function in Excel. So to draw the parallel, the way the if function in Excel works is you have if and then open parentheses and a logical expression. If the logical expression is true, then the value that immediately follows will be returned. But if that logical expression is false, then the next and last value will be returned. Now where I have value if true and value if false, there can be functions instead of values. And if there are functions in these positions, those functions will be evaluated, and then the values those functions return will be returned by the if statement as appropriate. So the if statement in Python is quite similar in concept to the if statement in Excel, except the if statement in Python is a little bit more complicated, 
because it has the option of the elif statement and it is executing code blocks instead of essentially single values or single functions. So now I'm going to show you an example of several if statements and I'm going to create these examples building upon the getItems function that I created in the last video. What the getItems function did was retrieve an arbitrary set of items out of a list. So to run this function the first thing we need is a list. And I have here a list of the names of the 200 highest paid CEOs in 2014. So I'm going to go ahead and execute this code cell to define this list by putting my cursor anywhere in the code cell and then hitting control enter. And you'll see over here in the console the code has executed and the list of the highest paid CEOs has been created. So I'll just go ahead and check that by checking its length. So LEN CEOs should return the number 200. Now the function that we had created before again is called getItem and the function getItems is defined in this code cell and let me go ahead and run that definition and then show you the output of the function. So I'm going to go ahead and select the definition of the getItems function and then execute it by hitting F9. So what getItems does is it takes a list, and in this case it's going to be our list of 200 CEOs, and then a second list containing indices, and it returns all of the list items at those indices. So for example, if I run this line that says getItems of CEOs and the list 1, 3, and 15, it will extract from the list the CEOs at index number 1, 3, and 15. And because Python indexes lists from 0, the CEOs 1, 3, and 15 will be the second one, the fourth one, and the 16th. So I'll run this function with F9. And the result is a list of the same three CEO names that we got when we ran this example in the previous video. And we can check that these are the correct CEOs by accessing those items directly. So for example, CEOs 3 should return Satya Nadella, which it does. So as I said before, we developed this function in the previous video. And if you want to see a detailed development of the function, you should go take a look at that video. But I want to review very briefly how it works. GetItems takes an input list from which we're going to pull items and an index list which contains the indices of the items that we'd like. The way the function works is it first creates an empty list out and then it steps through all of the indices in the index list one at a time and they're put one by one in the variable item here as a result of the for loop stepping through the index list and we append the value that's found at input list at the item index to the list out in this for loop. And once we have stepped all the way through the index list, the list of indices we want, we go ahead and return the list out. Now this function works perfectly well as long as the input list and the index list look like they're supposed to look. The input list has to be a list and the index list has to be a list of integer indices into the input list that are valid. But in the function as it's currently defined, we make no effort whatsoever to do any checking of either input list or index list. And in writing real code for the real world, failing to check these kinds of things in a function is a serious problem. Good code will check that its inputs are in fact like the kinds of things that are required for the function to work. So what we're going to do in this example is make this getItems function more robust by checking that the inputs are in fact valid and conform to what's required in order for this function to work correctly.
Now this function is intended to return the values at specific indices of an input list. So the very first thing I'm going to do is check that input list is in fact a list. And I'm going to do that in the following way. I'm going to use an if statement and there is a built-in function called isInstance that will check whether or not a particular object is an instance of a type of object. So I want to test whether or not it's not the case that this is a list. And if it's not the case that it's a list, I want to return from the function with some kind of error message. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to say if not, and then I'm going to use the built-in function isInstance. And the arguments of isInstance are the object I want to check and then the type of thing that I want to check. So I want to check if this is a list. So isInstance will return true if input list is in fact a list. But if it's not a list, what I want to do is to print an error message. So I'll put in here print and I'll say error input list is not a list. And then I'm going to indicate what the function is going to return in that case. An empty list is returned. And now I'm going to exit this function by returning an empty list. So I can use return and then just an empty list. Now I can use exactly the same idea to check that index list is also a list. So to check the index list, it will be if not is instance index list, and it should be a list. And if it's not a list, then I'll print error index list is not a list, and empty list is returned. And then once again, I'll use the return statement and return an empty list. So now I know I'm dealing with two lists, but I need to do more error checking because the integer values that are supposed to be an index list need to be valid references into input list. And I have a decision to make at this point. I could check all of the values in index list to make sure that they're valid, and if they aren't, do something like return with an error message. Or instead, I can begin the for loop and check each of the index list values one at a time as I step through that list. And that's the strategy that I'm going to use. So I'm going to move down to the for loop. And the first thing that I need to check is that the value in item is in fact an integer for each of those values that you get as you step through the index list. So I can do this with an if statement as well. So I'll go if is instance item, so I'm going to check item and make sure that it's an integer. And if it is an integer, then I'm going to go ahead and append to our out list the value from input list referred to by item. But if it's not an integer, so I need an else here. I need to print out a warning. So I'll go print and then warning index is not an integer. And then I'm going to indicate what I'm going to do and that will be to return a value of none. So now I need to append the value none to the list out. So now I've checked that every index in index list is at least an integer. But I need to go further and check that those integer values are appropriate indices into the input list. So for example, the input list would normally be indexed from 0 to its length minus 1. So I need to check that the values in index list are in fact in that range. 
but actually negative indices are allowed as well. So a negative index of a minus 1 would give us the last value in input list, and then these negative index values step all the way down to a minus the length of input list. So I'm going to save the length of input list, since we're going to need it, in a variable that I'll call n. So n is equal to the len of input list. So once I know that my item is an integer, I need to check that it's valid for input list, and this means that it needs to be greater than or equal to a negative n, and less than or equal to n minus 1. So I can implement this in the following way with a nested if statement. I go if item is greater than or equal to minus n and item is strictly less than n. Now if item is strictly less than n, it's going to be less than or equal to n minus 1. And this is just a little bit shorter. And if it is in the correct range, then I want to append the appropriate value of input list as before. So that's the original line of code. But if it isn't, I want to print out a warning and then output the value none. So I'm going to print warning index out of range. The value none is returned. And so now I need to append to the list out the value none. So now I think we have a pretty good function here. I think I'm going to change its name because input list is supposed to be a list and index list is supposed to be a list. So this is not just get items, but let's be more specific. It's get list items. So our function get list items then makes sure that both arguments are lists. And then as you step through the index list, it makes sure that each index is an integer and is in the correct range. So I think we have a function here that we are ready to test. So I notice that the spider IDE is warning me of a syntax error. You can see this little red mark over here next to the line number 111. And if I mouse over it, it says code analysis invalid syntax. And if I look at this line, you'll see that I've capitalized the statement print. And that doesn't work. It has to be a small p. So now it should be OK. And you'll see that the little mark disappears after a few seconds once I have the syntax correct. So now I'm going to go ahead and move down to the end of this code cell. And you'll see that I have a statement here that runs the old getItems function which we've now changed the name to get list items. And now I can define the function and also run this old test case by just using control and enter, which will run the code in this cell. So the function has now been defined over here in the console, and the test case that we've run before rerun. And you can see that the output has not changed. But now let's start to test our functions. So for example, let's try get list items CEOs and I'm going to give it for the index list something that's not a list. So I'll give it a string and let's see what happens. So I'm going to go ahead and execute this with F9 and you'll see we get the error message that the index list is not a list and it's returned an empty list and sure enough you'll see here at out7, it has in fact returned that empty list. So that tests that the function has detected that index list was not a list. Let's try something a little bit more complicated. Let's give it a dictionary for CEO list and see what it does. So I'm going to define an empty dictionary and then I will assign a couple of values. So I'll call the first key value will be A and I'll then assign that the number 5 and then I'll define another key value which might as well be B and I'll give that the value ABC and that should be good enough for our test. 
So then I'll do get list items and x, and then I'll use our list of 1, 3, and 15. So let me go ahead and execute these few lines of code by selecting them and hitting F9. And sure enough, we get a dictionary defined. And then when we run the get list items, we get error, input list is not a list, an empty list is returned. And once again, we can see that. So let me just make absolutely sure that X was a dictionary. So if we do type of X, it will show me that it's a dictionary. So the next thing I think I want to test is whether our checks on the values of the indices work. So if I do get list items and then the CEO's list and then let's use indices 1, 3 and then say 200 because that should be out of range. And I'm going to go ahead and execute this using F9. And you'll see that we get this warning, index is out of range, the value none is returned. And sure enough, the list that we get now has two names for the first two items and then the value of none for the last one. So that worked. Let's go ahead and similarly check whether or not negative indices work. So I'll first give it a valid example. So one three and then say minus 10. We'll see if we get a list of three names and sure enough we do and now I'm going to give it a negative value that is out of range. CEOs and I'll do 1 minus 201 and then let's do minus 30. So the 1 should be valid, the minus 201 should not be valid, the minus 30 should be valid. So let me go ahead and run this. And sure enough, the second entry comes back as none, and the warning is printed that the index is out of range. Now, there are a couple of other things that I might want to do with this function. For example, let's see what happens if my CEO's list is empty. So get list items, and I'll just put in, in place of the CEO's list, I'll just put in an empty list, and then we'll try 1, 3, and 15 again. And now it returns the list none, none, and none since all of the indices are out of range. And I think that's a reasonable behavior for this function. Another thing I could do is test if the input list was empty and then perhaps return an empty list if it is. But I think given the concept of this function, returning a list that repeats none is a reasonable and logical thing to do because those indices are in fact out of range and there were three of them. Now another thing I might want to do is just refer to a single index. So I might go get list items and then my CEO's list and then suppose I put in just 15. That seems like a reasonable thing to do and in this case I would want to get the item at index 15. So let me go ahead and run that. Now this doesn't work quite the way I'd like it to because 15, it turns out, is not a list. It's an integer. So the function is correctly indicating that there's an error and returning an empty list. But that's not really the behavior that I'd like. Let me just see if it will run if I change the 15 to a list of length 1 that's a 15. So get list items and let's do again CEOs and then I'll put in a list that contains one entry and that's the 15. So let me run that. So that works absolutely fine, but I really don't want to force my users to, to change a single integer index into a list. I think I'd like to do that automatically in the function. So let's go up and modify our function and see if we can make that work. So if we go up here to our if statement that checks whether or not the index list is a list. What we want to do is put in a nested if statement now that says if is instance of the index list is just an integer. So we check to see if index list was a list. If it isn't but it's an integer, what we want to do is save out that integer and then change index list into a list containing that single integer. So I can do that in the following way. 
So I'm going to create a temporary variable called temp, and I'm going to save the integer value in index list into it. Then I'm going to take index list and overwrite it with an empty list. And finally, I'm going to take index list and append to it the integer and temp. So what I've done here, if index list is not a list but instead is a single index, then I've changed it into a list of length one that contains that integer value. So this may not be the cleanest and most elegant way to do this, but it does work. But now I need an else statement that will in fact print the error under the condition that index list is both not a list and not a single integer. So let me go ahead and put in that else statement and then I need to indent the next two lines of code. So I think I've now handled the case where index list is a single integer. So let me go ahead and redefine the function in the console, which I'll do by selecting the code and then hitting F9. So the function is now redefined. So now we'll rerun the test case where we just gave get list items a single index of 15. And so now you'll see that it handles that just fine. So I've now given you the basics of if statements and showed you how to use them to make sure that a function is robust when arguments are given to it that are not the kind that it expects. Along the way, I showed you a very useful built-in function, which is isInstance. And it should be very apparent that if statements are an extremely important part of any computer language, and especially Python. They are very powerful and used constantly in a wide variety of situations. And this particular example has just shown you one way that they can be used in an extremely useful way.